Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and uh, I'm here today with two great, great humans, uh, Dare Sohei and Tada Hozumi. Welcome, my friends. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So, right, yeah. So, Derry and Tada work with something called cultural somatics, which is going to be a bit at the center of our conversation today. There is a, a animist counselor, an expressive artist who brings together liberatory equity facilitation, trauma based somatic therapy, and animist indigenous life ways in order to help people repair their relationships with the seen and unseen world. And Tada is a developer and practitioner of cultural somatics, working out of unceded Coast Salish territories, so-called Canadian Pacific Northwest. At the core of, his pra of your practice is the understanding that all oppressions, including white supremacy, are energetic ailments of both the individual and cult cultural body. Um, and Dare, you are in the Chinook territories in what is called now Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest of Turtle Island, uh, also called United States of America. Um, welcome, my friends, really, really welcome. And yeah, I'm going to start like most of the other interviews by inviting the two of you to just share a bit of your journey, your life journey that led you to this work, led you to explore cultural somatics and Maybe that will lead us also to know a bit more what is cultural somatics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how should we go? And then uh, I guess like, <laughs> I think the dance is already here, right? So yeah. Like, bringing so, the spirits and the ancestors and acknowledge them. As, yeah. Like we can, how do you feel about offering it as a kind of prayer, the, our bios? Yeah. Individually or? I think it's a, I think it's a good, a good idea. Do you want to just start and tell me when you're, I don't know. I'm a little bit nervous because it's kind of spin the bottle. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's real. You know what? Let me let me do the b boy thing, which is to spin a bottle, and then <laughs> if it points the pen points this way, it's you. Okay. It this way, it's me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's actually landed sideways both times. It's you. Okay. All right. Um. Well, before I start talking about myself, I want to start talking about some of the spirits that uh, I feel that are here with us and here with me and um, just give acknowledgement to the land that all of us are on, give acknowledgement to you know, the spirit of the coronavirus that is happening right now globally. I mean, I think it's a very important spirit that needs uh, respect and I just want to say that in this moment of, you know, tension, um, that there are very many ghosts and various kinds of spirits that are wanting to feel better. Like they really want to feel better. And our ancestors want to feel better. And, and then there are a lot of bodies around the world that want to feel better. A lot of various kinds of bodies, diverse bodies that really are craving, longing for feeling better. And so I want to acknowledge them and bless all of those beings. And I also want to bless the spirit of whatever this betterness is. And I want to call that spirit in to be with us in a way that allows this conversation to be just right and to unfold in a way that might be surprising and hopefully regenerative. Um, and so there are very many other kinds of spirits I could name. Um, but in order to just keep this brief, I just want to say thank you to all of those spirits that make our lives possible. Whatever names you have, whether I know them or not, whether I've forgotten them or not, thank you for making my life possible. And I will endeavor to enjoy myself as I continue to be surprised by my life. Yeah. Tata, is there anything that you'd like to add? Any ancestors or spirits that you'd like to say hello yeah. to? Yeah, I'd like to 
Mm. Well, I'd like to first start with acknowledgement thanks to Nuno who's brought us on for this conversation. And I also want to acknowledge that Nuno, um, I see behind you and around us is that the spirits of conflict, transformation, division, and emergence are with us as well. And all of them being good beings actually. So that's the first step is to welcome them all as good beings. All with um, gifts to shower. Um, but when we don't take those gifts, they might turn to poison actually. So there's uh, choices we can make, uh, but I hope we make better ones around that. Um, I also want to honor uh, my ancestors coming from the land supposedly of Wa, of harmony. Um, that is not necessarily love in the traditional sense that goes between one person to a person, but Wa is actually a field experience, a collective experience that's more than just an individual relationship. So that spirit is there. And there's many, um, yeah, there's many disciplines within my ancestral lineage that are about creating this wa or harmonic field. Um, so I think that'll be shared. Um, That's interesting. And I also want to honor like, um, you know, Dare's ancestors, um, you know, that have helped to me understand kind of like my own work as well. And also, you know, that those gifts, you know, um, are out there and probably uh, within that there's also uh, the spirit of dance, the spirit, I think, uh, we're all blessed by in different ways so that you know that is one place I feel like our ancestors meet each other I uh, want to acknowledge that and I'm happy to offer back to Tara as well uh, thanks thank you Tara thank you to all of you and all of your ancestors and all of Nuno and all of Nuno's relations and ancestors. And um, I hope we can have a, a rollicking conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Deep gratitude for yeah. this. Mm -hmm. So the question you asked us, what drove us here? Tata, do you want to, do you want to say what drove you to this place now? <laughs> mm. I have a compulsion to open that, but I actually feel the discipline is actually saying, I don't want to, and do you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's checking in all the time, right? Um, so thanks for the spirit of checking in. I'll, I'll go. Um, so, you know, I'm 40 years old. Um, I never really thought I'd be in this position. I was never really trying to be in this position. And I think that some people might say that I'm a teacher and I don't think that I'm a teacher. I think that I'm a practitioner. Um, I'm trying to practice and experience this life in the best way I can. And part of how that looks now is helping people with what I've learned because that feels good to me. It, it feels like a bit of a, it, feel, it would feel weird if I didn't on a certain level because you know, once once you've been helped up to a certain place, you want to help other people up to a certain place and just do that in a good way. And so I, I guess I'm driven by the, the, the this harmonic field as well. Like I'm driven by this disharmony in some way. Like I grew up in a very disharmonic way and in a very dissonant way. I was raised as a white boy in, um, you know, New England in Connecticut by my white mom and um, my dad is not white, is Puerto Rican, but you know, there's a lot of history and a lot of uh, trauma within, you know, mixed race marriages, you know, seventies, eighties and stuff. And so I was, I've been driven to this because a, my life was very disharmonic and I was very dissatisfied. And so I was very angry and defiant and I wanted to figure out how things worked. 
I wanted to understand things and I didn't know how, and also felt like crap all the time. I didn't understand why. And that just kept happening. And so part of the, part of the gift of disease is that you keep trying to fix it. You keep trying to heal. And so there's that, you know, spirit that has helped me, even though I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And then, um, you know, what also drove me here is that throughout my life, ever since I was born, I had extreme experiences that were not categorizable by Western science. So you might call them supernatural. But what I would say is that the spirits were invested in my life and were giving me life and trying to help me. And I didn't know how to understand that. I didn't know how to parse that experience, the dreams, the visions, the strange episodes, the weird synchronicities, and also like the terrible synchronicities that were all spirit in uh, spirit phenomenon, like spirits actually trying to be like, Hey, why don't you do this? Or we need you to do this for, and it's like, Oh, So on some level, most of my teachers have been spiritual teachers because I didn't have the spirit in physical bodies until much later in my life. I'm talking much later in my life. I can say now I have actual flesh and blood living humans to help me out with this. But at the beginning, I didn't. And so um, a lot of plant spirit medicine and a lot of just regular old spirits coming in and out of my life since I was a child are what drove me to this place. And I'm still going. So I don't, I'm not stopping here. I'm still walking. And that's part of the practitioner part is that like, I'm, I'm still going. I, I don't know where I'm going, but it seems like it's over there. And maybe if you want to walk next to me, that's cool. But like, I'm, I'm still, um, I'm still in communion with this force that's given me life. So this is this is what it is for me. Um, for me, uh, well, <laughs> I, I could say my divorce started it all, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, blessed be. Um, interesting. The first thing that really comes to me. Um, and maybe it's because of the people who are really struggling right now, um, emotionally in this time, you know? Um, is this like, uh, I'm a practitioner of, you know, uh, popping, which is a, a black and brown dance from the 70s along the American West Coast. Um, new working class, working middle class communities that, you know, with uh, a lot of, uh, black and brown people in auto factories and other kinds of mechanical factories. So inspiring them to um, also with the Vietnam War, like inspire them, inspiring them to do mechanical dances. And so that's kind of the tradition um, I've been a part of for the last, you know, 10 to maybe 10, maybe over 10 years now, which is actually not a long time because, you know, some people I meet, they're like, how long have you been dancing since two? So it's like twice as I'm twice as old as you've been dancing twice as longer. It's a reality I face a lot. Um, but I do think there's something very like, uh, um, yeah, just really important about the kind of re- regenerative emergent culture that people create from, in a way, nothing. It looks like nothing, but it's their ancestors' steps and stuff like modified for the world they're in. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to pay a lot of respect to that. That informs a lot of the way I think about pedagogy. And you know how Dara says, I'm not a teacher. I disagree with Dara. I think they're a bit of a teacher, but you know, they can think of whatever they want on that. But there, there's something about teacher and practitioner that the pedagogy within dance, especially street dance, that is very blurry and these roles go back and forth very fluidly. I think there's something about that. So I just really want to honor that because that's, I think, something I've been sitting with, um, honoring that lineage more in terms of my practice. Um, But I think for me, uh, what it really things start off with is noticing that, um, you know, that I really want to build a platform for justice that is based in how 
kind of like with my own ancestral lineages as a root. So for me, that was things like um, energy medicine, somatics, right? Like I was traveling these justice communities and didn't feel quite satisfied about um, the paradigm. And there was something uncomfortable to me about always having to make kind of my own lineages second fiddle, you know? And so my path towards kind of understanding that um, it kind of led me actually to meet Dara as well, because that's actually part of the journey, you know? So I had started this ancestral connection or healing or transformation work, trying to understand how did my ancestors see the world? And that's kind of the first initial idea around what we call now cultural somatics, which is just really a container, to be honest, it's just cultural somatics in reality, what we call it is just a constellation of ideas. You know, it's like a soccer game and you can call the game a soccer game, but you can just call it kicking balls, you know, like, I think that's the reality. And um, this idea that um, groups of people are bodies, because when I asked what is white supremacy, what is massage, what is all these things? And then my ancestors kind of came to me, you know, kind of in a dream almost like state. They're like, everything that is sickness is stuck energy. And that was it. And they made it that simple. And that's kind of the premise is that like of the work that I'm doing now is that, oh, right. Like when you look at a group of people, it's a body. So the violence you see inside of it, it's stuck energy. It's not all these things we think it is. I mean, it kind of is, but it's also not. Does that make sense? You know, like. Uh, a brick in front of me isn't a brick when you look up close. We just call it brick with our naked eye and with our regular human ego perception. But when you go up close, it's not a brick anymore. It's an energy and information. And so I came in with that. And that's kind of, um, and I'm trying to understand that more on the path there that I met Dare actually, because uh, um, I almost feel like I want you to talk about that part of the journey. The meeting, the meeting part? The meeting, yeah. Because, I mean, I know about it through my own lens, but I think I keep getting reminded, especially these days, like what the encounter was like for you is something I don't actually have as yeah. much reference. It's kind of like, you know, when like, yeah, how did you, how did you, I don't know, this is kind of like, you know, like couples when they're like, how was it like when you first met? It's like, I thought he, <laughs> I thought he fucking smelled <laughs> he <was> an <laughs> asshole. But there's something I liked about it. And then you're like, you know, the other person's like, I thought you really liked me off the bat. <laughs> so yeah, I want to pass that to Dare almost. Yeah, I think it's sure. a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't think you smelled. I didn't know you, but I knew that my ancestors and my field were sort of pinging different things off in my associative network as I was seeing things in the world. And so there was this very ripe time in my life, which I'm not going to go into, but I was working directly with the spirit of death. And I was really accelerating this kind of like understanding of these biological processes that were actually underpinning what we call trauma, but actually isn't trauma. This is also like the brick is not a brick. Trauma is not a trauma. It is on a certain, so one level, on another level, it's stuck energy. It's unintegrated resources. It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. you're telling me my trauma is a resource that I don't understand. It's like, yes. And I had to go through that and everyone goes through that. So I was I guess I, there is sorry just to interrupt. I, I guess I was thinking a very simple uh, example of that is people that go through a traumatic experience and then become healers to others or helping others heal that the the, the similar right. traumas, right? That's that's right. just a very yeah. straightforward way to think about. That's a that. very straightforward way to talk about it. Some people talk uh, about post traumatic growth, which is mm -hmm. like another way to talk about it. But also all of these things still kind of center this idea that trauma is bad and we need to solve it. This is also part of the brick is not a brick or the problem is not a solution thing. So anyway, I was experiencing all of this myself with my ancestral healing and with my co-regulating with death. And when I say death, I mean like death, the actual spirit walking into my room and talking to me and me being like, okay, I'm going to shut the fuck up now and listen. Um, so there's all of that. But I was. I also do this thing where I'm like, hey, Google, Oracle, tell me what I need to look for. And I go online and I just look at things that seem like they might be interesting to my soul. And at around the same time, I found a few connected dots. You know, one was this school um, called Organic Intelligence, which is 
uh, part of my lineage of training um, by a man named Steve Hoskinson. And so that's very good. It's very good, but it's not completely animist. And Steve would be the first one to tell you that, like, you know, he's talking to primarily non-animist audiences, like non-indigenous people who are traumatized. So you're not going to front load spirits to those people. You're going to start way basic biology, complex systems, etc. But also I had a lot of training in hey, somatics. Yeah. Sorry, another, do you want to explain what animism is? Because I feel like we just drop that yeah. spirit <laughs> but yeah. let people on the for me it's just like down. blah blah but animism is basically the fact that so i have this tapestry back here of this great old oak tree mm. and so this oak tree is a spirit that exists in all oak trees but it's also a spirit of the tree and it's also imbued in this tapestry but also this tapestry is made of material that also has a spirit so all of this all of these beautiful layers of spirits are all alive in the world in different ways, and they all have agency. They all are doing things without me telling them to do them. And um, animism is just the recognition that every everything has a spirit, every being is a being, has a spirit, and every being is interrelated, interconnected. And it's sort of, we're co-creating the universe together mm -hmm. with all the beings. And it's not just like humans as this sort of apex creator, Actually, we're more like uh, remixers, if you think of it. Like, we're remixing the tunes that we get. We're like, oh, it would be cool if we put it like this, and then we did this, and then we danced to it. But actually, the music is not really ours. Yeah. I think a really good pop culture example is if people have watched Tidying Up by Mary Kondo, Mario Kondo, that's on Netflix. She's Japanese, and she's very animist. Like, she goes around cleaning the house, but... Like to I've learned I've learned wonderful stuff with her. I'm shuffling my t-shirts now because much better because yes. of her. She's such yeah, she's she talks about putting chi into the t-shirts. If you actually watch her, she's uh, like, yeah. so you put chi into the t-shirt, she taps the books awake. She's like, Oh, books, you need to awaken them before you sort them out. You know, what I mean? that that's that's an animist tradition. And part of what was interesting, not to is to just a little context, is that like um, I've always been an animist because in a sense that my cultural tradition is, right? J Japan is very, still now, a very strongly animist kind of community. I would um, say all like, Asia, it's compared with, for instance, Europe, in Asia, it's much more alive animism. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. And, and of course, a lot of that's just formal, to be honest. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not foundationally spiritual, but a lot of it survives. The spirit of it survives. So you can see it in our pop culture. But it's, you know, meeting Dara was kind of like a, a giving kind of a fragmented, like nonlinear story. You know what? Maybe I'm going to sit back. I'm going to give you that part of the story when Dara finishes that. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So, so I, was, I found organic intelligence. And really at the same time, I was looking for other people that were able to, because I had a lot of somatic training, a lot of somatics. I was a performing artist, you know, a dancer and massage therapist you know i did all these things and i had to heal from my diseases i had like six years of like chinese medicine therapy done on me so by osmosis i learned a lot of stuff i was like wait a second you're talking about ghosts and chinese medicine they're like yeah I'm like oh shit i need to figure something out <laughs> um so anyway i had all of these these things and you know i, I had done martial arts so i also was like oh the hara you know, your lower belly, your lower Dan Qian in Taoist, uh, Taoist traditions is like the seat of your power. But not many Europeans talk about that. Not many white people talk about that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Unless they've been trained in these models. And so as I was navigating the world of healing trauma and also spirit work, I was trying to find other people that were like, look, it's actually the same thing. Biology and spirituality are not different. And if you sit in your lower body, you know that. But if you don't sit in your lower body, you think they're different. And I knew that, but I was like, who else is talking about this? And the first person I found that was really talking about it was Tara. And I was like, everything that I was reading, I was like, yes, these are just different words, but I think the same thing. Collective body, like this fractal nature of the universe and how individuals make up groups and those groups are bodies and those groups make culture. And then there's the ancestral cultures. And it's like, whoa. We're all like nested and networked. And over the course of our relationship, we've sort of developed more language. 
But at the beginning, it was really just a gut knowing. My gut was resonating with Tata's gut. And we were like, oh, this is, this, this is actually the world because we're seeing it now. And then now another person is mirroring it. And so it can go faster. So we started a relationship, you know, very slowly, just talking and sharing and being on lots of Zoom calls together way before we ever started thinking about working together. And it was a big, it's been a, it's been like a three year journey has had a lot of events. So let's just say that. It's so great when we, when we find each other huh? against, against the odds, because it's like a few billions of us in the planet. So yeah. great, great to witness this from the two of you. I'm curious, uh, there, without naming the names, do we mention the D and the F? And that, <laughs> because that has, that is a big part of how we met too, in the sense of, um, yeah, sure. may I sp speak very anonymously with a lot of rice paper around it? <laughs> yeah, sure. You should do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, well, give, give me a shot, trust me. No, okay. I trust you. I trust you. No, but Dare also had a, a teacher at that time, or there were, in a in a teaching program, I think that might even be a better word at this I point. Teaching, I was in a teaching practitionership program. Practitionership, was, yeah, program, and um, somehow that piece of work around. Um, oh, I feel it integrating actually a little bit, even just talking about it. Um, you know, for many reasons, or actually very single reasons, Dare ended up leaving the program, but it was it was a like our creation of the work that we were doing together, there was this kind of shift in shakiness. Um, yeah. You know, you know, it's, it's the way I describe it is like when a parent gets upset that their child is pregnant with somebody else's child, you know, and then the parent is upset at, you know, and, it, it not being able to control the child no longer, you know, that, that was kind of the feeling without yeah. naming all the mm -hmm. names. Yeah. And, and so that's also interesting. That's also a side is like that spirit of that shakiness is also, I think, starting to presence between me and Dara as well now, because as our practices mature, we're getting impregnated and we're like, okay, this family, <laughs> this family of constellation of work is starting to grow. I think, so I just wanted to mention and honor that too, yeah. but I think the reason why that's important is um, at the time, the way I met through there was that I wrote an article that basically was kind of like a summary of how white supremacy is actually a trauma. When you actually look at the foundational kind of behaviors in it, you see these are trauma responses. Um, and that way, you know, and Rezma Menachem was also, who's a, you know, black somatic therapist who's mm -hmm. kind of writing about the same thing at the same time, kind of independently of each other. Just wanted to acknowledge that. but. Um, what I, and that's when I started really thinking about like, oh, so it, this is a complex trauma though. So complex trauma originates from childhood, right? But what is this cultural complex trauma that's in the cultural field? I was like, oh shit. Like, and, uh, man, it's hard to name all the people who fed into it, but I, you know, Tar Tad Hargrave is another person who really in an interview talked to me about white people have this ancestral trauma of belonging that's passed down. I was like, oh shit. Because I understand attachment theory. I was like, damn, that, that's it. It's an attachment issue. And so I was thinking about the ancestral layer, layer of that and how the ancestral piece shows up in our gut, actually. So our, in harm to our microbiome. That's kind of like the center of my practice. A lot of it's center of gravity is like, you know, you see the antibiotics, um, you know, take them when you need it. But like, all you know, like sugar, like all these modern facets of our life harm our gut. And that is actually trauma that's reified in our culture. So when I started speaking about that, um, this other piece came at me, which was this kind of ancestral healing and trance kind of thing where I feel like it was kind of connected to the community that Dara was studying in. Although I think Dara's practice, as more and more understand, is actually quite separate from that community, it exists before and it can't be defined it. But it was it was an interesting occurrence because that and then I feel like there was a kind of alchemical process between us where we were started clarifying what each other a bit fuzzy on. Because I wasn't very clear on the um I was not as clear on the um 
ancestral connection and and like oh spirits are real like i mean my culture says that but I'm, okay right. let's let's talk about it based on that premise and then you really bridge somatics with that and so i think the good way to say cultural somatics is not really a modality to me or an approach or really anything it's been a vehicle for me and dare mostly between here to kind of like let those spirits of somatics and animism and kind of go like blah, 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 right and actually merge because a lot of the time they're actually biology and spirituality are people say it's the same but it's not it's not quite there yet it's 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 a little bit it's a little like when you're talking about the spiritual thing it becomes a bit dissociative and when you're talking just about the biology piece there's, there's like a lack of perception and imagination and there's always been that tension. And, and I think a lot of our working together has been about, I don't know, this might sound a bit egoistic to put it, but one of the places maybe where in this current cultural body that those pieces of information are integrating in our relationship actually was mm -hmm. really integrating going like, oh, it's getting that indigestion almost of that separation is being, was being digested on a very, yeah, uh, yeah on a, on like, yeah. That's I, 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 I want to just like sh share one thing as I witness you, you talking about cultural semantics, which is really interesting and something, something we mentioned as we were preparing for the interview. And is this idea that on one side, when you're doing exploration, exploratory work, let's say edge work or things that are really, you know, like very, uh, I wouldn't say novel, but that kind of go out of the, of the uh, normal of the habitual, there's this kind of creative tension with, you know, f looking for the words. And, and we kind of, I kind of get a sense you are in that space also that every time you talk, new things emerge or better ways to say it. So this is a, something, some, a, a, a way of expressing that is evolving. It's constantly mutating. But also acknowledge one thing just straight ahead, that is that we are talking about something that involves practice and that when we try to put words on trying to explain what you guys do, obviously we kind of dead and something that is alive, something that is expressed to movement. So that's one of the things I want to say, just out, out loud for those hearing us, bear with being in that kind of field space of, I don't exactly get what these guys are saying and just, just let, don't get stuck with that. And the other thing is maybe coming back to trying to touch this, body of practice this kind of thing that is a couple of things kind of um, really st stood out for me one is this deep kind of uh, awakening or an uh, opening up to understand that the material world what we see is a manifestation of invisible of a, invi invisible fields like i'm going to say things that you mentioned with certain names in, a, in my own language but it's like how I sense that. So that can be either uh, the past that is still pretty much alive in us, like we are the, the we are the youngest generation of a human body that has been on the planet for uh, millions of years in evolution. Uh, we are entangled with other all other bodies, uh, living bodies that are here that are also the the new generations of their long lineage bodies in a in an earth body that has been here for <laughs> billions of years. And also, what is in oh, front what, of us? Oh, just, the, just to yeah. not to totally interrupt, but one way to understand it is like the newest cells in a body, right? Mm. Our yeah. cells regenerate, so we are the yeah. newest cells. But that doesn't mean the structure of the body is necessarily going to change that much with the regeneration. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's really important, also, because we need to acknowledge that ourselves we are not we are not like we are not the same like a month ago, and our cells are totally re renewed. Uh, throughout the life many, many times. So thank you for that, uh, Tada. And I would say the other thing is, I, and I was going also to say that the, the future also is kind of shaping how, how we, how the, the visible world we see, right? And what you, guys, what you guys try to see is like, from what I understand and I want to know more is how when we look at a certain situation, let's say like, for instance, getting the example now of COVID and all we are, because it's such an interesting, we are all on this all together globally uh, at the same time. So we have this space where we are in this experience. And of course, we are experiencing many things, but we need to also see this as part of the, of the movement. 
you know, as and so kind of getting a sense of what are the energies that that are at stake and and then try to see where is it that we need to work with the cultural body with this kind of invisible the way this invisible energies invisible world shapes uh, the material or uh, starts mattering let's say that way how we can work in ways that can be healing and regenerative so yeah. that yeah but I want to know more yeah so I'm just going to riff a little bit. Um, I don't know what Todd is doing. I had to go off screen for a minute. But so the reality is, is that like, if we actually accept that our animist indigenous ancestors actually had some knowledge that was actually accurate and they lived in a way that was actually useful and practical, and then some traumatic things happened and now we're here. But if we accept the fact that like, there's these cultures and they're telling us the same thing, basically. Hey, why don't you remember your original instructions, custodians of the earth, you know, like all these, all the cult, all the indigenous cultures are basically saying the same thing. If we accept that that's true, then we also have to look at what they're doing, not from an anthropological lens, but from an actual practical neurobiological lens, not idealism and religion, but from a neurobiological, pragmatic, relational, lens no this when, is it this is when this you is the do thing those dances when you do those dances and wear those masks what the fuck is actually happening and that's what i've been trying to find out for years i told you i started as a dancer but i was doing things like authentic movement and like weird buteau and like physical theater and clown and i was getting into these trance states and i was like something else is going on here if I repeat this foot, this simple foot pattern for 20 minutes, suddenly I'm like having visions. But what does that mean? Does that mean I'm hallucinating? Does that mean I'm crazy? Or, but when you look at the animist lens, which isn't the Western psychotherapeutic lens, it's not about anima and animus. Young, bless his heart, was still a white guy trying to be a witch in like white guy culture, right? No, but you just remind me of the the the. Like a candomblé, a candomblé um, ritual. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I, I participated when I was in Brazil, and how powerful it is the, those dances that the the initiated people do to kind of embody a certain spirit, and then the spirit kind of shows something that that the community needs to see. Yes, right. So, so I'm not saying I'm at that level, but I'm glimpsing that because I'm I'm in relation with those kinds of spirits, and I'm saying. Okay, so I don't have a culture to help me hold this possession state, which is actually helpful. The, the ritual that you just talked about, those are possession states that are actually beneficial because they're held in a structure that's actually useful and practical, right? It's like when you're fire dancing, you need to have the person next to you that has like the, the flame deterrent and the fire extinguisher. It's not like the fire is evil, but you could light everything on fire so there's somebody over there being like well if something goes wrong i'm going to do this thing yeah but that what, what you're saying is really important this thing of con the container let me just tell a very brief story that i think will be also gen generative for you guys is i i remember something striking for me was uh, a couple of years ago in the work of an uh, of a collective of people called the rules where some of my friends where some friends were involved they come up. They kind of find out that the some tribes of the north of this of the northern zone of the lakes in in North America, um, that they had the word for a certain spirit uh, with some kind of cannibalistic um, aspects uh, would would possess someone in the community. Like the person would start to act in an egoistic way, take more from nature than they needed. And they, they, they call this spirit the Wetico, or in some, some of those cultures, Windigo. And they work, they had rituals and things to help people, you know, come back to their normal state uh, or to a more ar harmonic state with the environment. But then when the white people arrived, they felt, this, they, they felt like, shit, man, all this culture is Wetico. Is the, way, the Wetico spirit is embedded in all aspects of the culture, which for me was really striking for a number of reasons. But one of them is to say, to kind of have this capacity to put aside something to say, 
this I'm 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 touched by this. This informs a lot of how I show up, but this is not me. So there's some possibility there to work with this in a way that I can kind of uh, integrate it and doesn't don't become more you know uh, possessed by it without knowing. That's right. That's right. So I've been meaning to jump in for a while. Even like I tried to and didn't really go well first time. It's like a <laughs> wild train that <laughs> jump jumping. But actually, uh, uh, Wetiko was one of the first things me and Dare talked about. Actually, right? Yeah. It's kind of like that was kind of like our first date. Like, <laughs> you know, do you know Wetiko? It's like, yeah, I know Wetiko. It's like you know Wetiko. <laughs> like, I've seen that movie before. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think uh, it's appropriate to call it Wetiko too, probably, right? Because that was yeah. probably <laughs> it's like the reality we live in. But yeah, what you go, I think that's like, a, um, that was one of the first things that we discussed, actually. And we had both kind of actually read about it already. So that was kind of interesting. Um, so just want to honor it. So that spirit's with us today, too. You know, so honoring that being. Um, I think I think I just have like one small mention around. And this is bringing me about what is the choreography that we were talking about of in, in thinking about, I guess, uh, I think before going on this call, we talked about violence as a dance. You know, so when you see a woman call the cops on a black man, there's a certain, this is the thing that it's not about the spiritual thing. It's about the neurobiological thing that's actually happening in these animist bodies. That's why it's important because violence itself is a dance. Violence is a sequence of kind of like, um, improvised and scored movements actually that we're having trouble changing so white woman gets activated the score is through a series of improvised processes she's going to call the police and when the police show up they have a score through a series of improvised um often and this is not 100 percent, but through like their score right is that through a series of improvised events they might kill somebody like that's the score and then there's this individual difference in terms of how people get there. But there's these markers, right? And those scores are actually something that are within our cultural nervous system patterning. They're not necessarily just individual. That's something that people, I think, they need to understand. That's like the Watiko thing that people are talking about. That's an actual phenomenon. But in extending that more, I just want, because we talked a lot about ancestors up till now, I think me and Derek were both very clear about this, I think in our practices, is that exploring the past can be its own kind of dissociative state. So in exploring how our ancestors danced, it's also like, um, and this is where I think the uh, street dance, like, but you still modify the steps or you take the steps and you make them your own for your own time and for your present moment meaning. Like, you know, um, I met uh, somebody who's like a, a street dancer and also African dance teacher, you know, mm-hmm. Africa, quote unquote, because it's really big. <laughs> but he was like, this step from this hip hop dance from, you know, it's like you can trace it to villages in Africa, mm-hmm. you know, and then rhythms, you can trace them to different communities, you know, like you can, you can actually do this. And then in so-called America, they became a new thing. And, and you know, there's now instead of bongos and, and djembes, there's, drum machines you know what i mean there's djs the music is different there's urban environment the culture is, has changed but so there's also like um i think it's really important because people often think of ancestral healing as this kind of regressive thing and it just becomes child regression to be honest if i feel just like, like a, it's more like a reconfiguring like a... that's a reconfiguring so, yeah, it's actually very futuristic ancestral healing in a weird way. And I and I feel like just mentioning it because I feel like ancestral healing and how what we think about it is another spirit around me, I dare have right. So, totally. Yeah. Well, just to kind of like maybe close one loop of the spiral, right? It's not gonna be closed, it's a spiral, so there's open borders, there's open edges. It's like the thing that white culture and so-called scientific scientism materialism cartesian thought is this idea that like <clears throat> possession is just crazy people but if you look at it if those people were just kind of creative like oh these people are us hallucinating gods and goddesses and possession 
why would you have to genocide them? If they're just like nutty little forest people, like, you know, really, like I'm trying to be glib here, but like, unless they had actual real knowledge and real power, why would you have to genocide those people mm -hmm. who are doing all of those ritualistic possession, trance, mediumship, hands-on healing, talking to spirits, creating miracles, helping their villages, talking to can, the weather spirits. Can I respond to that, Derry? Because something very strongly emerged in me. Yeah, absolutely. It's real strong. I was thinking it's, it's, it's part of what somehow happened in, in human history of, of with sedentarization and starting to build environments for, for us to live, maybe with the trying to meet the need of more security and predictability and things that we kind of, everything that spilled out in the world, everything that ran out of control that would be like this, this light, this energy forces, this life forces that are permeating everything that, that is alive. There's a wild aspect into it. You know, the, actually I have, I, I remember a very good sentence of that, that, uh, emergence is the intelligence of the wild. It's like this this field of potentiality, right? And and that was not a good space for control and uh, and predictability. You know, <laughs> so it's like opening the Pandora box. Right, right. And just as human beings, we are always playing this role between nervous system stabilization and nervous system transformation, which is inherently destabilizing. Right. And so if we don't have enough stability, which is what all those ritual containers are for, we're not going to be able to integrate the new transformation, which is a destabilizing process. So we're sitting in this kind of decontextualized culture where the ritual has kind of gone off the rails because there's no containment. And so now just different people are acting out different parts of the choreography and we see it as violence, racism, misogyny, etc. And that's the cultural body doing its, its dance, but it's not contained. We, we as a culture aren't like sitting in a circle and being like, okay, cultural body, why don't you lay down here for a second? It's Just like, it's like sig signaling something in the, in the collective body like that needs attention, right? Just like a, if you get a, some sort of sickness in your body, but we, we just give pills or we get entertained ourselves collectively to distract us from paying attention to this, which is kind of very close and very dear to the topic of conflict that we are exploring. Because yeah. in a conflict, people tend to either to try to sort it out. You know, let's get to a resolution. Either fight or flee or win the fight, or, but not stay with it uh, to, to notice and to allow it to manifest. Yeah, and I think that kind of brings us to that conversation about like so violence is a dance conflict mm -hmm. is actually a choreography like these are actual choreographies with scores then the thing that we struggle with and this is the ancestral piece is that um you know and i can feel this emotionally even you know like what is the choreography <laughs> for justice and I don't mean that of like finding out who's right or wrong. That's I'm not that interested in that. I'm talking about the choreography of of um, resolving that stuckness is really the base thing. And it's something you know. I think this is the raw part. I think you know, in me and Dare, like one observing Dare. I mean, and also me going through, you know. You know, it said Dare got impregnated with knowledge that the, their stepfather basically didn't approve of, uncomfortable with. And there was a really poor choreography that spilt out from that, right? And then even at this juncture that me and Dare, I think, in terms of where our careers are going and speaking to, this is kind of a threshold here. I think a little bit of the grief that I have is like, we actually, me and Dare, I don't feel like know the choreography. Like we, we're actually both trying to, like, um, it's it's not just for the community out there, but even for ourselves here, and probably for all the relationships we're in. We're trying to figure out what the choreography of of justice looks like and accountability. And accountability again is not about like on an energetic level. It's not about right or wrong. It's about which spirits need to be seen 
what do they need? What do I need back? It's just a, it's literally an account. So you're balancing the account, but we don't really know the choreography. Not completely. Of, yeah. Not completely. It's like, like we know maybe some of the techniques that we know some of the, we know some of the tools and the palettes and we we're doing this, mm -hmm. but it's also like, yeah. You know, I, I think that one is that people listening, just just opening it up for a second, and even myself, I have various ideas about the definition of things like justice and accountability, right? Like, there are there are literally competing memes about justice going on right now, and I, I want to. I, <laughs> I think we have to explain what a meme is very quickly. Because <laughs> that's like another word, like we just dropped. Like a meme is like some, yeah, something that Richard Dawkins introduced. But it just make it really short. We are using the word meme to mean like a thought that has godlike properties. That a thought being a being that has its own desires and needs. Yeah, it's like an idea that spreads. Or yeah, this is like spread. the yeah, this is like the DVD commentary. Yeah, sure. But also, you could think of like just bringing it back, like the spirit of Wendigo or Wetiko, you know, blessed to be that spirit of narcissism, that spirit's alive and has its own agency and is a meme with godlike powers because it is a god. Or you could say a god with meme-like powers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like for real. And so even internally, our systems are kind of navigating these various god beings that have ideas and definitions and beliefs attached to them. This is what justice look like. looks like. No, this is what justice looks like. And if we were to say, well, what does harmony look like if justice is actually a harmony, that's an even deeper level of the same question. Well, I think harmony looks like this. No, I think harmony looks like this. But we get closer and closer to something that's actually deep inside the gut, which is not a thinky place. It's a deeply sensory place. Sensory relational is another kind mm. of hybrid word that I use. Sensory relational. It's like when two animals are in a dark forest and they're sensing each other in the dark, there's this real unknown field that gets generated between them. And we all know that feeling because it's a little bit like a freeze response. But if we can unthaw the freeze response and expand our attention from our gut, we are actually able to navigate one step and get a lot of sensory relational information. You know, it's. I was hearing and I thinking like you, you, one of the one of a couple of the interviews I've made was with people who do trekking, and I was thinking you guys are trekkers in a sense because what Tada you were talking about movement and dance is actually you're trying to you know dig into how a certain thing comes into shape and what is it that we need to un unpeel in, in, in this space, collective space, that allows us to uh, manifest different movements in the dance, right? That we can shift the dyna dance dynamics. And I love that because I don't know, we, we're, we're getting close to the end, so we kind of need to wrap up. And I would like also to invite you guys to can name a bit some of the things that, that we didn't talk so that just for us to keep in mind, maybe for future conversations. Um, but in tango, for instance, which is one of the dance, one of the dances I dance most, you need the tension between the bodies in order to feel connection. So that's another thing because sometimes people with tensions, it's like another thing that we kind of might think like this is bad. We got associating our bad, very black and white kind of lenses but actually is the tension that holds things together somehow. So I just wanted to bring that and invite you guys to say, name some things and perhaps also share if you can a couple of questions or a question you are holding in your, in your inquiry, in your practice inquiry kind of journey that, that you guys are in that are look really, sounds really great. Yeah, I can jump into the circle. I mean, I know when they have dance circles sometimes, there's a competition to get in the middle to steal the energy. So I think I just steal the energy. But um, I just wanted to explain, you know, like I have some thoughts that are coming just because we have a third reference point. It's really helpful is that a lot of the violence that we see around us or conflict, and this is even between the tension between me and Derek, let's say, this is a proposal, right? Is that we take on 
the quarrel of the gods in our lives. You know, like when you mentioned memes, right? So thought entities that what is justice? And there's this conversation, a back channel conversation spiritually going like, those are competing ideas. And those ideas actually can get activated in their relationship because they have a nervous system, right? And so like, I think justice is this, and I think justice is this. And in some ways, like me and Dare have been in conflict with all these other, like, or the cultural somatics has been in conflict with all these other things around it, or because it's saying, I think, no, this is what justice looks like. And then the other memes get upset. And then there's this kind of territorial kind of conflict actually. And, you know, when you think about our processing, neuro logical processing as kind of market share in space like that there is a kind of a scarcity dynamic that can happen right and you know like abundance is real but also scarcity is i don't like they're they're parts of uh, yin and yang they're part of the same coin yeah but um i think something that's really important to recognize there when we talk about spirit possession being a fundamental property of how conflict arises is that like um, in relationship, let's say like that. So I'm offering actually now a piece of the choreography, actually offering a piece of, of a dance of what accountability could look like. Is that like when, when the, um, <clears throat> is to recognize that the, the conflict that you may be in with another being, there are gods behind it driving a lot of the emotions that are over threshold, that are over the capacity of the nervous system. Those aren't necessarily ours. Is that they're actually um, gods at conflict with each other. And we actually have the option to not take that on. So part of the practice, part of the choreography, I think I'm offering, and there's not the full thing, is like what a choreography of um, of justice and accountability might look like is first, as each person recognize that, oh, there are other beings attached to me that are feeling this way and how to first give them what they need. So it's not necessarily, a, or maybe at least not just because it's a lot of, our conversations around justice and accountability are human centered as in like this human, you know, meat body, like flesh and present lifetime. But an important question is actually like, what do we do with the other beings in the room? And I think in the conflict, we're so patterned to keep looking at each other as the first thing, but it actually might be like, no, it's actually outside of us. And those are the beings that like need to be acknowledged first and be like, oh, like this being over here needs something. I don't know if giving that being food or nourishment or what it needs or even saying, hey, you need to behave. If that's an individual or collective process, that part of the choreography, I don't understand. But I think one part of the choreography I want to offer is, um, is giving, acknowledging the gods for who they are and then moving towards meeting their needs and desires. So you're like, and not necessarily going in right into, we are having a conflict because that's how we've been trained. That's like the, that's like the current choreography, the current score. And it might have a place, but I'm not sure. Anna, what do you, what do you think there? Well, I just want to add onto what you said, because I agree for the most part and just get a little more nuance. It's like, we also need to go to the gods, not in a child parent relationship. If we are talking to the gods from an insecure attachment place where the God is this all powerful being and we need all of their bliss and love and we can't exist without them, then fundamentally that's not a peer to peer or adult to adult relationship. I'm not saying we're the same kinds of adults. I'm not saying we're the same kinds of bodies. But there is a fundamental energetic shift that can happen when you go, hey, I respect that you've been around for 10 million years, but you got to actually, I don't consent to this part of the relationship. And most people, when we start talking about spirit possession and gods and stuff, they go way into this like strange fable of a God is more powerful than me. They don't exist. Like it's a very strange dynamic. And so each time we 
approach this unfolding, it's almost like we have to reframe the pattern on a neurobiological level with secure attachment, because that's the part of the thing that a lot of spirituality is missing, quite frankly, in my opinion, is that it's a neurobiological attachment pattern that's primarily how we relate to each other. And that can also be seen as a God, and it's also very much under our shaping capacity. I can shape how I feel securely attached in this situation based on all sorts of protocols. We have lots of people working on attachment. All I think we're saying is, let's also transfer that to these other real quantum realities that are acting on us right now. I really love that. Um, and I just wanted to like get nerdy and separate a little bit. It's like, <laughs> I feel like I marked the space on the floor a bit. It's like, this is the choreography. This is the, but then you talked about the quality of how you get there. You know, like this is you're describing the quality of the movement to get to that space. I'm curious to end the call. Do you feel okay to show what that would look like? Both of us <laughs> engaging. That's this like that one little part of the choreography of like, this is the place we're going to try to get to. And this Oof. is the quality of how we get there. How does that feel, Dan? Well, I don't know what you have in mind, but I'm willing to give it a shot for sure. Yeah, I was thinking, I, I can feel getting excited. Like, this is fun. Like, this is the kind of work I want to do on interviews and shit. So I think, I think maybe it's just, um, I don't know if we need to name or not name. Maybe that's like one spirit in our relationship we can observe that we're connected to and the emotions we're connected to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we want to need to go as far as naming who they are and how they feel, but then going through just a bodily internal process of giving that, it's like a trance of giving that spirit what we need. I know we can both do that. We're like great at mm -hmm. that. But I was just wondering if it's be interesting for people to see just that one initial step like that one yeah, breath yeah. and movement because it yeah, go for more. it Tyler. go for it i think is a good it. way to to come to a closure for the talk yeah okay it might go a little bit over time you're, we you're, already you're, went you're, over time so <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> we, we spill that wine out <laughs> oh, okay okay <laughs> spilling the wine okay you just say so, so yeah. <laughs> um how transparent do you feel like do we name the spirit and the feeling yeah we can do that i think it's pretty i'm simple. okay with that yeah, it's okay. fine. I just wanted to, you know, get a level of consent of like trans, like yeah, how yeah. much we share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe um, uh, the th actually, do you know this? Something that we do is often together is to create a harmonic feel of some hara breathing. So maybe if you do, Nuno, you're here. You're part of the ritual too. So I, I think Nuno. Any other tips for Nuno? The belly breathing. Just uh, just breathe into the center of your belly. Okay. Put your consciousness cool. there. Okay, put your mind there. So, and we, me and you can both start that, right? And if you're actually following along and watching you, like this is your invitation to do it. So you can first imagine a uh, place in your belly between your uh, cubic bone and your navel and inside. It gently contracts and expands with a very natural breath. Do you want to add anything there? For just for basic purposes, you know, the eyes can be open or closed. And the mm -hmm. point is to just allow it to be natural and not to try to do anything. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I really like that tool you have around uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. How does that feel? Yeah, yeah, use it. Yeah, go with it. Yeah, so I invite you, if optionally, also to invite a landscape where your nervous system feels really settled. So maybe you see that with your eyes open, maybe you see that with your eyes closed. And you might even see that this landscape, even though me, Darren, you know, 
are all in different spaces on Zoom, our imaginary landscape may connect because it is one earth still, even in their mind's eye. And into this place where we feel settled. Um, everybody can do this too. Um, but, you know, me and Dara might do it in a particular way, but invite just a little bit of a, maybe an idea or like it could be just a f feeling like, oh my God, my partner doesn't do the dishes. That might be a spirit. Um, whatever their name is, or it could be like, I'm really upset by white supremacy today. That might be a really big spirit to chew off, but you can if you'd like. Um, yeah, any suggestions on how to manage that there for people? I would say it's just like, it's like if you pick something that's annoying, see it far away on the horizon. That's what I tend to do mm. because it's there's a distance that our minds need a spatial distance. So don't think of it up close. Think of it far away. And see it like an animal or a shape so that you can see how it moves, how big it is, its quality of movement. And you might be able to invite it in closer as you're like, oh, actually, I feel okay. Like, even if it's white supremacy, but everybody's nervous system is different, right? Everyone's nervous system is different. So err on the side of caution. You can always add more salt, but you can't take away salt. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and the spirit can be like my partner doesn't do the dishes to white supremacy to, you know, your family's energy, you know what I mean? Like it could be all kinds of gradations and, um, you know, it could just, yeah, it could be a lot of things. It could be, but a little bit of that troubledness you feel in relationship. And I think for me and Dara, we, we would, we would do it to model like what is trouble in between us and her, like, but not necessarily each other's, but in our right. know, vision. And right. I can report we, maybe we can report to each other who they are and how it feels to be, like, perceive them, however um, close and f or far they are to us. How does that sound? Yeah, do it. Yeah. Nope. Okay, nothing to add there? No, I think that's good. I think we'll just, people will see it in the modeling. Okay. Um, who wants to go first? I'm okay with going first or second. I don't have a preference. I'm going to do the pen. Oh, it's me. Okay. So the spirit I'm sitting with, it's a little bit over there, is like the spirit of, um, the spirit of like traumatized spiritual communities, if you know what I mean. Um, we might experience that now as high demand groups or, um, you know, what people call cults, you know, I can even like shiver when I f hear that name. Um, but also like just different levels of high demand. And, and, the, and, the, and the trauma of that, because that's a really traumatized cultural experience. Um, and when I face them, I feel, I feel um, sensation-wise jittering in my shoulders, um, a little bit of emptying of energy in my lower body, in my legs, in my head, a bit of like, it's, it's actually more emotional even in my head. It just, you know, teary and, um, I see the being as very lost and um, I don't, when I actually sit with it, I don't relate to this. I don't identify with them. I'm not like, oh, that's like me. I see something very external that's lost and trying to find ground. So that's, that's the being that I'm with and how they read in my body when I mm -hmm. observe them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you want to go towards trying to give them what they need, or do you want me to go and name name the thing that I'm sitting with? Name the thing that you're sitting with. Yeah. 
Okay. So when I sit with this thing that comes up, I, I notice this, um, I'm just going to call it the anxious parent spirit of this. It's, it's almost like a lonely parent, like a single parent or a single mother, but this parent who's like very controlling because they're very afraid and they're, they feel alone. And there's like a feeling of like tightness in the throat, coldness in the belly. And then, you know, they're, they're kind of like trying to like be strong, but it's a very kind of like almost like self-violent kind of strength. It's not flowing. It's not creative. It's all very like uh, afraid. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they're, it's, you know, there's sadness, but there's also fear. Like I, I respect what you're going through, but get away from me kind of feeling, you know? And uh, I really want that being to have more support. Like my feeling is like, you need help, but not from me. <laughs> That's my initial feeling state of, of that. Well, I think you actually moved into that giving what they need part. So I think maybe we can go into a light trance and offer mm -hmm. a little bit of that. Yeah. And I'm just going to say on my end, um, my imagery is actually more going over to the being and being like, hey, I'm going to lay a hand on you. We can hold hands and you can actually just have your feelings. So that's kind of like the place I'm going to be moving towards. Just to yeah. describe people what the vision might look like. It might end up being different, but my impulse is there. Right. So we can go so in for a basically, bit. Basically, if you're doing this at home, don't do anything you don't feel good about. You can actually just be like, I wish for that being to be well. Right. Yeah, exactly. Wishing and stuff like that is also okay. And you have a whole landscape to work with, right? Right. And how about we, um, <clears throat> how long do you think we want to go in? We should finish as soon as possible <laughs> okay well give us a give us a second <laughs> oh no that, i wasn't asking you that question dude, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> but let's three go, minutes let's just go, let's go for two minutes to let's respect two minutes, the, um, two minutes okay. yeah okay. you know can you keep two minutes for us or no you're in it okay don't worry about it we'll, <laughs> we'll, okay i'll go ahead we'll rest in our inner time So um, my guy just walked away <laughs> after a while. Yeah. But um, actually the um, experience was that they're actually quite afraid to be on their own. And then when they got a little bit of intimacy, they were like, okay. And they started walking and I was like, okay. Like, um, 
I had my feelings about that, but I was like, you know, there's an attachment feeling there, but it was like, oh, this is mine. I can manage it. Yeah. I was like, no feeling. It's, I just have feelings. And that's okay. But, yeah. 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 And for me, I just was noticing just this need to feel supported. And I want that being to feel supported. And I also want to feel supported. And so it just became more about calling in ancestors just to feel support, not to have a conversation, mm-hmm. not to like understand anything, but just this feeling of like, oh, this place in my heart or my chest that needs support. I feel like it's distributed now, like we're all holding hands. And if I fall, you'll catch me. And if you fall, I'll catch you. And like, no big deal. We're just, we're all playing together here. And that's sort of the feelings that I'm left with is just like, oh, the anxiety really just needs to know that it's supported. Whoa. I, I just want to share that on the on the first part of the exercise, the, the spirit of Bruce Lee came up. Bruce with, Lee? Yeah, yeah. I got this kind of he appeared in my in, in my mind and and mm-hmm. saying, "Be water." So <laughs> I, I was sitting with it a bit, like there's, and I think basically he he was invoking the spirit of water to me, and it, it felt That's to me now in the yeah. second part a bit around maybe water needs us to to be more in connection with with, with embrace her more the spirit mm. of water that is kind of so supportive of life or in the flow you know so it's yeah. a, bit, a bit of right thank you thank you so much there thank you tada i love the conversation it's, it's actually feeling quite pain painful to stop it now but if we went <laughs> way way up you know, oh, really? way over the time <laughs> I'm sure there was a lot of things to say, so just just maybe this is a, a rain check for another time that you can. Yeah, continue. absolutely. Is there is there is there though, like just a minute of like probably first aid or kind of just like information for people to stabilize after that experience? Yeah, please do so. Yeah, and just I like think a, actually, like I a, just I just hand over to you to close the conversation, Tana. Yeah. Okay. And then that. And be there. Okay, and there. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, actually, I feel like that's your domain. Do you want to talk a little bit about aftercare? Yeah, yeah so aftercare is pretty simple. Nuno already brought it in. Or Spirit- after joy. After joy, really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's not make yeah. it, like, vigilant. Yeah, no, joy. no, it's not about being vigilant, but, like, ple- simple, pleasurable things that you can do that don't involve a lot of negotiation, which would involve, like, drinking water, taking a bath um, or a shower. But, you know, you acknowledge the water, right? It's cleansing you. Going outside with bare feet, looking at the trees, looking at beautiful flowers. Uh, Here in North America, it's springtime, so there's a lot of beautiful beings flowering, and just appreciating them is is a thing. Basically, you just don't want to think too much about it. You don't want to ruminate about it. You want to go and, like, listen to music, dance, eat some good food, like, give yourself a massage. I know we're in quarantine, and I know that it's limited, but... There are still things we can do with the elemental forces. You know, we're talking about earth, air, water, and fire, and wood, and metal, and stone. You know, I'm always on my calls. I have a whole pile of rocks next to me that I touch, and I just be with, I just do a little rock meditation. Basically, don't think about it too much. Don't try to like figure out what it means, and don't try to like create some great meaning out of it, because that's where the, the ideological meme problem can start again. Oh, now I know the answer to all my problems. Like, whoa, pause, just be, just be. And um, that's the aftercare that I would share. Right. And I think in closing, I would add that, like, um, I just, I just noticed that's another piece of the score that just came. So that's like actually where we want to, it doesn't actually define where we want to go but it is the quality of the next movement after that piece of movement that we did. So I just want folks to just know that, that just offering that reflection, that was choreography as well. The quality of movement to exit that place on the dance floor is this kind of not knowing. Um, yeah. Not knowing, not overthinking, not attaching. I think that's really helpful. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you everybody. so much to you, thank Nuno, you, and everyone. Yeah. And yeah, just blessings to all beings. Thank you so much. Blessings. Thank you.